These Creditors in Commerce workshop sessions, here and after sessions, are the private exchange of ideas and concepts between the providers and the recipients. The content is not meant as legal advice. The use or attempted use of any idea or procedure discussed in these sessions, as applied to the recipient's own personal transactions, cases, or controversies, or applied to other cases, may or may not result in a favorable outcome or the same outcome as discussed in these sessions. Each transition or transaction, case or controversy, may be different as a result of unique actions or unique statements made by the parties therein, and each different act or statement in any transaction affects or may affect whether any procedure or idea discussed in these sessions is relevant to the recipient's transactions or that the outcome thereof will be depicted as in these sessions. The discussion of ideas or procedures in these sessions is not exhaustive of the subjects being discussed. Many ideas and concepts that can affect the outcome of any legal or commercial procedure are not discussed in these sessions, and the fact that the recipients may not be aware of these issues may have an adverse effect on the outcome of the recipient's procedures. It is the responsibility of the recipients to understand their own transactions and to apply the appropriate and complete concepts necessary for a procedural and substantive remedy thereto. These sessions may be redistributed privately by any recipient to another recipient requesting them, condition upon the fact that this notice is provided therewith. If you have any questions, you may contact Creditors in Commerce by email at harmony at creditorsincommerce.com. Okay, so give you a little preview of the public trust, private trust, the roles therein. So, with that, and we discussed briefly some of the maxims. Um, what I would suggest is uh, we're going to include in tomorrow's documents an entire, um, what is it? It's several pages of. Uh, maxims of law, but if you just did a search on Google and type in um, Bouvier's, which is B-O-U-V-I-E-R-S, and maxims of law, or if you have Bouvier's dictionary, um, uh, legal dictionary, it has a, a great section on maxims, and it has them in Latin and translated into English. And it goes through, I would say it's, I think, I want to say it has over a hundred in there, maybe several hundred. Yeah, there are literally thousands of maxims. Yeah. Read some of them, just like Brandon, you heard, he picked up some that speak to him. There's some I pick up that makes sense to me with the way I think and that I use to balance what I'm thinking about. So he's giving you that Bouvier's is a, a source for him. There's actually several books, Maxims of Law, with thousands of them in there. And they're fun to read, and when you think about them, you can apply them to all of this commercial law that's being utilized today for your, for your remedy. And they are the foundation of law. So when making your contract, when you keep those maxims in mind, and you may even list them in your contracts as the foundational law of the contract. Uh, my brother had an interview a couple weeks ago, and the first thing he did, besides establish his authority by telling him, okay, sit there, he, <laughs> it was as if he was conducting the interview, and he established the maxims of law that were going to be, uh, that were going to be held in that particular interview so that he could establish, here's the law that we are under today. So, it, yeah, you know, we we ought to we ought to have Garrett, you know, give us a five ten minute thing on it. Well, we could keep it down if if you because wanna, it's a story well worth hearing. If you yeah, corner Garrett, the, it's the it's one of the best creditor stories ever. And uh, but I know we, we, do we want to cut it out of the video. Let's let's hear from him after dinner because he's got a great story. 
and when you go on my Monday night last and listen to Brandy with his story, some of you have heard it from last Monday night, and you couple it with some of Brandon's and Jack's stories and mine, you just understand that truly consent makes the law. Yeah, actually Gordon on his, uh, what, it's a Monday night call you do, right? Yes. On uh, Gordon's Monday night call, a lot of times what they have on there is a lot of the people go on and they share their experience that they've had um, after taking into consideration uh, that which we teach and they're basically giving their own testimony of here's how I use these principles and here's how they worked for me. This is real life experiences by right. our students that have used them both successfully and unsuccessfully and what their thoughts are and how it worked for them and it's just wonderful to see that these people can they can do it just like young Alina here earlier this gal is she's learning the principles to do you just don't answer questions except with questions you know we teach youngsters stranger danger what's and with you all strangers come up and talk to you all the time and you just start blabbing away and <laughs> And that is a good point, that, um, that ha understanding that we don't not answer questions to impede the process, but to establish that we don't take a position on things. And what I mean by that is, so often, we want to be right and assert something. And in order to truly be effective at this, you want to always be in a place of asserting nothing. That I don't assume I know anything. And so that includes the assumptions and presumptions that go along with a certain line of questioning. You know, um, for instance, if somebody, if you had tendered an instrument for set off of a debt and you were asked well is this your signature on the instrument you know somebody shows up at your door and they're uh, well we're here to question you about this so not just show up at the door brandon had cid and a treasury agent show up to talk about four of his bonds out of 30. yeah so these are you know you need to give them a little story about that so they have a basis to understand this right better. and actually i had a uh, district attorney or what do you call it a agent? a usa or no it was a uh, district attorney investigator an investigator for the district attorney and um and it was a, over an instrument as well this was a bonded promissory note and he pulls out this folder first things points to this instrument. He goes, well, is this your signature on that instrument? This is just a copy of an instrument, it too, is, isn't it? It was just a copy of an instrument. However, the presumption there was that there was something wrong with the instrument, right? So the, the issue isn't this is a signature. The issue is there's something wrong with it. So if he answers the question with a yes or a no, he's going to feed into what the presumption is, and he's not therefore going to have rebutted the assumption or presumption, and there's going to be a problem. Yeah, so, so what did you say? So I asked the question, I said, is there a defect in that instrument? So now he's going to, that's offer, counter offer, and he's going to have to come back and accuse him or make an accusation. He's not going to do that. Right. And Government then, does it right. And, and then he actually proceeded to go, well, I don't know. So then I asked if they had another question. I go, well, are you telling me you're not qualified to make any determinations about negotiable instruments? He said, well, no. I said, well, if there is no defect and you're not qualified to make any determinations about the instrument, what's it matter if that's my signature? You see? So see, it's not, he's not arguing. He's getting to the root of it. Yeah, I'm just like, I'm, I'm trying to understand why is it you're truly here? You know, and then by rebutting the presumptions with a series of questions, not I'm just asking questions to ask questions, but I'm not assuming I know anything. So I'm not trying to be right about something. And that's one of the problems a lot of us create for ourselves is that we study these principles and then we want to show how smart we are and how, how well we know the law. Now, and Brandon has gotten real good at stuff like that. 
but he also got real good at, he once was in jail there for taking on a little thing, and he was showing him how much he knew, and he got yeah. smart mouthed. Yeah, I did, I did, and it, and it, and I, you know, I paid the price for it, you know, there was a little bit of, it got a little physical, and, and again, we were talking earlier about, you know, who, the, the come from, who I'm being with whoever it is I'm interacting with. And in that particular situation, <coughs> I had taken on this very righteous, like, I know what I'm talking about kind of attitude. And I started getting, you know, a little smart with them, you know. And the one guy... Hard to believe. <laughs> hey, Hard. And the you, know, you know, when you get knowledgeable and you do look at somebody and they are at that level, it's real easy to take on and think you're somebody. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you this. You know, Jay Staples White is quoted. It has cost many a man life or fortune for not knowing what he thought he was sure of. One of my favorite questions for people is, are you sure? <laughs> and here's Brandon at that time coming from a position of, I'm sure. Yeah. And yeah. that cost him a little bit of uh, rough and tumble. Yeah, the, the and a little misery that he didn't need <laughs> to go through, but it's what he needed to go through, and he loved it. Yeah, that, because he truly has gotten very humble, yeah. sorta. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he really has it, because it still comes up. It still you know, comes Brandon up. can tell you what he, him and I are real big proponents of. We know exactly what we know. That is, we don't know much. Because you remember, I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about back when I started this. I thought I was Gordon Hall. I thought. I knew where I lived, and I thought the United States was my country. I've subsequently come to know who I am, who I'm not, where I live, and what my country is, and it's not the United States. So what could I really know? I only kind of think I know what I think today. So it really helps you when you really think about that the come from. This is a big thing that Brandon's introduced. Jack and I are wholly supportive. Your come from is everything. Your humbleness and love. And once again, if you're under God, wouldn't you love the ser God's servants? Wouldn't you love these fine government officials? Wouldn't you even love your brother who does wrong? I don't want him in my face. I don't want him jacking my car and things. But, you know, what's the big deal? It's insured or this. Let's just relax. But if you hold contempt in your heart for someone, that's what will come across in whatever it is you're speaking. And that's where I was coming from in that moment. I was holding them in contempt. You know, like, you guys are a bunch of idiots. That's kind of <laughs> what my come from was. And, uh, Do you think they sensed that? Oh, no. they sensed it. They sensed you know, it for they're sure. A judge, policeman, they're experts in people. They know right where, they can feel you, just like when I'm talking to you, when you're talking to the opposite sex and kind of a thing. You can feel, or another guy, if, we're, if Sam and I are talking, and I'm talking in a condescending tone or with a little... Uh, contempt in my voice he can sense and you can sense and feel it in a moment can't you now what who's this guy think he is all i know is i'm i'm really nobody i really truly believe i'm just no better than anybody else no much no more no less we're all sons and daughters of god and we deserve each other's love and respect that's absolutely. a fact absolutely absolutely and in that that particular moment you know he he will they were uh attempting to coerce me into giving them fingerprints and a picture. And the head of the jail, he comes in there, he goes, you know, if you don't give this to me, I'm going to hold you here indefinitely. And that's when I started thinking I knew something. Like, we'll see about I that. I go, you think you can hold me more than 72 hours? <laughs> he says, oh, yeah. I said, we'll see. <laughs> so, I, so I was holding him until... And, of course, they held me less than 72 hours. <laughs> they weren't going to be able to hold me longer than 72 hours. And, but it, but that, at that moment, it also got real physical for me. And I was stuck in a refrigerator for about six hours. Physical no means clothes. they batted him around <laughs> some, knocked him up yeah, a little bit. They, you know, they didn't blood him up, but it wasn't very pleasant. No, it wasn't pleasant at all. It was just enough to get his attention, too, interestingly. Yeah, and, and it taught me a lot, you know, because here, even... Being a person who's constantly practicing it and mindful of it, I get caught up in my, my ego as well, thinking I know something and wanting to prove how smart I am to those around me. And uh, being humble is uh, 
definitely where I prefer to be. Um, because in being humble and truly being loving and not holding them in contempt creates a different environment between you. And it's like every time I've been pulled over, you know, every, uh, the only time I've been given a ticket was the one time that I felt and was coming from a place of fear. And then all of a sudden, and I still got to keep my car and everything else, and he let me drive away, and he's still really a really nice guy. But when he initially walked up to the door, I, I felt fear in that moment, you know, as opposed to gratitude, being humble, being loving, you know, and every other time that, you know, these officers have walked up to my window, and I've just been like, all right get to interact with somebody and these guys are great people and they're doing a great service. Every time I was in that place, they, like one guy, same state, both times I got pulled over in Arizona, it's the first time I was coming from a much different place. Me and this officer on the side of the road talked for 45 minutes. He didn't even care that I never driver's license. It was like a non-issue. He just kind of glazed over like, all right, you know, I'm a driver's license, whatever. And we continued to talk for 45 minutes about what he, what he did and what I did. He was interested. Well, what, do you, what is it you do? And I told him, well, you know, I study the law and, uh, and contract, and, and I attempt to, you know, teach people the intricacies of contract and how to use that in their lives for good and to create, you know, remedies for themselves. He's like, wow, that's pretty fascinating. And, he, and I started telling him, well, you know, what, do you, what is it you do out here? You know, he goes, you'd be surprised. And he started, started telling me about his day-to-day, -day, you know, the things that he comes across every day. And he was telling me about how they come across all these people attempting to perpetrate terrorism. And at first I'm all, really? Well, come on. Because like, <laughs> I, I live in the reality that that's just a bunch of hooey. <laughs> There's no terrorists, come on. And he was telling me, no, you know, we come across, you know, people trying to move C4 across the country, you know, who are, you know, people who are working for these terrorist organizations trying to move highly explosive materials. I'm like, wow, I really didn't think that was going on. He's like, yeah, you know, that's part of the reason we're out here and why we, from time to time, we'll stop people. You know, if it's, you know, an out-of-state vehicle goes, because a lot of them come from California. They get it at the Long Beach ports or whatever, and they try to move it across the country. And, you know, he was explaining his day-to-day -day and everything, and it was a really, really good interaction. Like, I, I drove away from that, like, wow, that was pretty cool. That's a, you know, pretty neat guy. Same thing when I got uh, and another time in, in California. And the guy, I just happened to be going to visit my kids who live in way up northern California. And those of you who are familiar with uh, Mendocino and Humboldt counties, these are uh, areas of California where their economy is based on the cultivation of marijuana and the movement of large amounts of cash and marijuana going through their counties. And the first two questions he had for me were, do you have any marijuana in the car? I said, well, no. I said, you're and look at this, I even offered it up. I go, you're more than welcome to search my vehicle if you'd like. He said, no. Nah. All right. He goes, do you have any, what was the word he used? Something about, exce oh, excessive. Do you have any excessive amounts of cash in the car? Reach in my pocket. You know, it's 40 bucks excessive. <laughs> <laughs> he smiled. He said, no. Okay, well then, no, I don't have any excessive amounts of cash in the car either. And we proceeded to have about a 10 or 15 minute call, or, yeah, call, <laughs> interaction between each other. And uh, it, it's just, it, it, the interesting thing in that particular interaction, he goes, because he went and checked my record, he comes back laughing, he goes, Mr. Adams, you haven't had a license in over eight years. He goes, you know what I'm supposed to do? <laughs> he goes, I'm supposed to take your car. I'm supposed to take you to jail and impound your car. He says, but cooperation goes a long way, and you've been really nice. And he goes, so I just wanted to let you know, you know, you were maybe following that guy in front of you a little too close. Be a little more careful down this road. I said, thank you very much, sir. I really do appreciate everything you're doing out here. He goes, no problem. And that was it. No ticket. No, 
I didn't fight with them. You know, I'm not here. You know, I, I definitely am very careful about the battles I choose to get involved with. You know, I'm not going to choose to battle someone over my right to travel down the highway when my number one focus that particular day was I'm going to see my kids. You know, I'm not here to get into a conflict with the Mendocino County Sheriff over whether or not I can travel with or without a driver's license. That was not my priority. Now, at another moment, if I had nothing better to do, I may take that on. But in that particular moment, my priority was getting up to see my kids. So choose wisely in how you, like actually another story, my brother once had heard Gordon telling a story about how he had interacted with a, I believe it was probably an Arizona State trooper. California. And, oh, was it California? Yeah. Okay, it was California Highway Patrol. And, uh, you know, he proceeded to ask Gordon for a driver's license. Driver's license, or uh, Gordon asked, well, may I see some identification? And the officer was, you know, well, what do you need my identification for? Or this badge and this car is identification enough. And Gordon proceeded to ask him, are you refusing to identify yourself? And in Gordon's experience, you know, Gordon's, for being a big dude, he can be very soft-spoken and come from a very humble kind of place. And the guy just kind of, you know, at the same point, he's like, you have a nice day. I'm giving you a warning. Yeah. You have a nice day. But my brother told me about his experience. He tried the same exact thing Gordon did, but he even recognized and acknowledged that his come from wasn't quite the same as Gordon's. And that immediately <laughs> these guys, it turned into a, a, like a, a heated confrontation where the guy pulls out his gun on my brother. <laughs> and Garrett's all, <laughs> what's that? Put it to his head over showing a driver's license. Right, right, because you're asking him to identify himself. So <laughs> you can see how you know, things won't always go the way you've heard in a story. And Garrett decided, well, I'm not going to try that again. You're, you're going to, you, <laughs> you, you've, got, you've got my story. We started out, the police officer comes and says, you were doing 82 miles an hour. And, <laughs> you know, so? And, that's, and then it went on like that. You heard Garrett's story, my Monday night with Brandy. You'll hear Brandy's with no plate on his car, nothing, just a great interaction. And they will vary. And as you're going to be taught in this, your administrative processes are going to vary. Everything's different. Got to go with the flow. Yeah. And now, I've also had a time or two, or one other time in Manhattan Beach, you know, with the cell phone. You know, pretty soon we had the street blocked off, half a dozen police cars. <laughs> and, you know, I had a lot of fun for about 40 minutes with them, you know. So. <laughs> yeah, because I had nothing to do, better to do than to see what they, how far they push, you know. So it, there's definitely a time and place for everything. And... Um, and another thing to be mindful of is that there's a lot of people who will use the processes because we're going to give you a, pr a pretty comprehensive view of administrative procedures this weekend. And these administrative procedures can be twisted in such a way that I'm trying to inflict something on someone, meaning I'm trying to go after a police officer. I'm trying to go after someone else. And that is, you're cr automatically creating a controversy and an adversary as opposed to, I'm here to bring remedy, I'm here to make all parties whole. So always take a look at what it is you're doing and is my process attempting to bring balance or to make all parties whole, harmony, bring harmony, or am I creating a controversy? Understand the purpose of law, to bring harmony. We have laws that say don't kill people, don't home invade, why? So we have harmony. That's all the purpose of this is. All this contract is to bring you into harmony with your brother. And, and like sister. I said, there's a lot of people teaching the same exact mechanics that we're teaching, but they're teaching it from a place of, well, 
you're not an authority over me and I don't have to listen to what you say. These people, if they had their way, would have a lawless society. Now, I very much believe in sovereignty. But like I said, my view of sovereignty is its ultimate responsibility. And when you come from is such of the, uh, much like these other patriots and uh, quote unquote sovereigns out there that you don't have authority and I'm here to fight you on this, that creates a high degree of confrontation for these people to the point where they get themselves arrested, they end up in jail, they attempt to, like I said, it, it escalates to the point of shooting. People are shooting each other back and forth. And now, unfortunately, because you are seeking freedom and opportunity through an understanding of law and contract, you're automatically categorized as one of these fighters, one of these people who's out to get the government. Paper terrorists? Paper terrorists. Like, you should see the things they had to say about sovereigns and sovereignty after this incident with uh, all the shooting that went on. And He's they just automatically lumped all of us together. That, oh, watch out for these sovereigns. You know, they're out to hurt us. They're out to create anarchy. You know, and that's not at all what I'm about. And I, I would guess that most of you in here aren't about that either. That it's not about creating some kind of controversy or living in a lawless society. I very much like the fact that everything is by consent and contract and that the people in my neighborhood don't, can't drive 80 miles per hour down the street when my kids are outside playing. You know, if they're going to drive a state vehicle down a state road, I very much like that there are state officers who will keep them in line and keep them from being unsafe with their vehicles. You know, I'm very much aligned to that. Like I said, I'm very thankful that those officers are out there doing their thing because the reality of what I've experienced, and this is just my own interpretation and my experience, is that there's a lot of irresponsibility out there that a lot of people have just left to the common law and, oh, we're not going to charge you unless there's an injured party. Well, I don't want my kid dead on the street to be the injured party that gets you punished for driving 80 miles an hour down a residential street. I'd rather see somebody enforcing the contract of my community. See, it was agreed upon by my community that the streets that we live on, where our children play, that you won't drive faster than 25 miles an hour. And even at that, people can still get hurt. But it's an agreed upon concept, it's agreed upon principle of my community that we, we got together and we decided as a community that we wouldn't stand for this. I actually had a student one time asking, and this is actually, he's from this area, uh, not Massachusetts necessarily, I think he was from New York, and uh, he was basically attempting to get me to teach him how he could drive 200 miles an hour with impunity. Uh -oh. Yeah, and I'm just like, you know, yeah, it's possible, but you're the last person I would teach that to. <laughs> if you drive 200 miles an hour down the street, I want you to go to jail, because I got kids on those streets. <laughs> Because I guess evidently he had this very fast car and it just shouldn't be driven unless it's driven at excessive <laughs> speeds. Yeah, exactly. That's what racetrack's for. But he wanted to be able to drive anywhere he wanted with impunity at any speed he wanted to. And in the reality is, with this technology, he could up until he hurt somebody. Do we really want to wait until this idiot hurts somebody to take him off the streets? So, again, there's, uh, this technology can be used for selfish purposes, and that's what I kind of always look at, because a, a lot of the work I do isn't for my own personal issues. I don't have a lot of personal issues around contract and law, but whenever I'm assisting someone, just like when I'm interacting with any government agent or agency or anything like that, and I ask a lot of questions, I'm asking them a lot of questions. 
like when I took on that case for the private contract deal with the construction company. I first was wanted to establish, well, what's your intent here? You know, did you do, do you feel you've done something wrong? Do you feel like you're in breach of a contract? I had to get a clear understanding because I'm not going to just help someone who's attempting to hurt someone else. I wanted to gauge, are you just, do you just want my assistance so that this person that you've wronged doesn't get their justice? You know, and through the questions that I asked and the way that he answered them, I was able to establish that the fault that these people were looking to cure wasn't his. That because he was the only contractor still in business on a job and the person who was truly responsible didn't have any assets, this, this homeowner wanted to come after him because they could attach a judgment to his assets. So it wasn't that he did anything wrong. So in that moment, the question is, you know, am I doing this for me, for my own personal gain, or am I doing this to bring some kind of harmony? Because he wanted to argue the facts with them, you know, because there was, he was like, well, you know, this is what, they, this is what was the, the damage was. I didn't work on this part of the house. This is what, the, he wanted to argue the facts. I go, we're not here to argue the facts. I said, we're either going to offer them a solution as creditors, or we're going to conditionally accept what it is they want based upon certain terms and conditions being met. You know, okay, you, we conditionally accept, you know, paying for the damages done upon your house under these conditions. You know, condition one, did we create the damage? Were we somehow responsible? Did we have a contract that we're in breach of? You know, so we went through all these terms. Here's the terms under which we will accept liability and responsibility for the damages done to your house. All we need is for you to rebut these presumptions that we never breached a contract, we never did any damage to your house, that we were the responsible party in this, you know, that basically just putting it on them. Hey, we're, we're not saying we're not going to pay you, but come on, just show that we should pay you. You know, don't just make empty allegations that because we're the only ones still in business that with assets that we should lose our assets because you've been damaged. You know, there may be someone else you need to be seeking your remedy and justice through. So always gauge your process on am I hurting someone else or am I bringing some kind of balance, some kind of harmony to the contract? Because if my approach is, well, somebody's got a problem and I may be able to assist them with coming to a, an agreement or creating a remedy or a solution. Because if you're always mindful of, well, I'm here as a creditor to assist, to make all parties whole, it will help you in when you're gauging your, in creating your process of, well, you know, I don't think I should maybe go there with this one. You know, because I've actually had people who have taken the, the, the documents and everything we're going to share with you this weekend, and they <laughs> mutated them into, I'm coming after you, IRS agent, as opposed to, okay, we're in agreement. All we're going to need is for you to show us this, 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 and this, and then we will be more than happy to provide you with the remedy you're seeking. And they took that very uncontroversial process and turned it into, and if you don't do this in 10 days, you're going to owe me a million dollars a day, compounded daily with interest of 25%, compounded daily, like r ridiculous amounts of money to where within a week of the IRS agent not responding, they're now on the hook for $18 million. Like, come on, is that a reasonable process? So, and, and like I said, all they did was change some of the words of stuff that we've used. That's all they did. They Once took again. a process that we, had, we created for creating some kind of remedy and bringing some kind of harmony, and they turned it into, I'm attacking you, Mr. IRS agent. 
good, good faith is required, is imputed into every contract. You need some good faith, go look up good faith. Yeah, that's, uh, the UCC has a great little part on good faith. How without good faith, we don't live in a civilized world and we don't have, a, uh, we don't have consent or contract. That good faith is presumed. And that if you're acting outside of good faith, that remember we were talking earlier about how your conduct will nullify contract. That there is no contract there because you're not acting in good faith. I've got a, had an ex-student that was in the middle of a divorce deal. And he did a private administrative remedy with his, with what was his then wife so that she walks out with nothing just to close out of the closet and not his name or anything. And he takes the four kids. And I said, do you think that's good faith? Do you think the judge is going to enforce this private agreement? He says, administrative process is administrative process. I said, I'm warning you. You know, good faith is imputed into every contract. You think those children don't have a right to see their mother? What is going to be as you see fit? If she kowtows to you or what? And but then he, what? And what was his true intent in that? in creating some kind of control over his ex-wife, having some kind of control over her relationship with her children. You know, what's your true intention? Remember, intention is the soul of the instrument. And if your intention is to manipulate and control the relationship so that it serves you, a self-serving contract, that's not acting in good faith, and you've now nullified your own contract by not acting in good faith. So see, there, there are some ideas, some principles that you must be conscious and aware of because this will come up when you're contracting, that if you don't automatically go to a place of good faith, you won't be creating an enforceable contract. And those are very simple principles, like the principle of good faith. I, I think it's less than a paragraph. What is it, one or two sentences in the UCC they talk about good faith? Yes, and they it's do got, talk it's about got good its own, faith. It's got its own section or anything. I believe it's in Article 1, is it? Is it not? Article uh, it's one. in several articles that actually it? talks about it. Yeah, it talks about good faith. So, and it, something to be, the, and again, the UCC, see, actually, I, I assume everyone in here is in our, our mastery course, and I forget that you're not. Um, in our mastery course, we did an entire weekend just on the UCC. And I talked about the significance of the UCC. We don't look to the UCC as an authority of law. Our private contract is the ultimate authority. It is the highest form of authority. What we look to the UCC for, it is a uniform standard. What the UCC did, and this is what makes it such a miraculous piece of work for me personally, why I look at it with just awe, is that it took those maxims of law that we talked about, those axioms, those self-evident truths, and it created an entire system of code, a uniform code of international contract, so that when you say Exercise ordinary care, oh, it means something, and it means something worldwide. It's, the UCC is the United States version of commercial law. Every civilized country of the world has some type of commercial law adopted so that, that commerce can take place. And, it, and really, and it's very open. It's very much just, here's the standard of contracting. That's what the UCC, so it's, you'll never see me quoting the UCC, meaning like by section number or article number in my contracts. He'll quote the words. But I will use those words. You will see words like the exercise of ordinary care. You will see good faith. This is the surety's good faith effort at providing mm. remedy or for the full satisfaction of liability. 
you know, you're using these words because they have a very definite meaning, meaning in international commerce, in contract. The standards of contract worldwide, these terms have a meaning. And when I, that's what I use the UCC for, is I will pick out those phrases and incorporate them into my contracts because they have a standardized meaning. Words that are accepted everywhere in all 50 states of the Union and District of Columbia and Puerto Rico and all those kinds of things. So it, and really, and believe all, it or not, all nations. Those, because the, they, all, they all operate under these same standards of contract. Words are so subject to ambiguity in the English language that they've established certain words intended as a complete and exclusive statement of the terms and conditions of the parties, uh, tendered as full satisfaction of the claim. These are words that they recognize as enforceable and understood across the board. So why not learn to speak law? So he's recommending you get some of that UCC language or look at some of Brandon's contracts, look at some of mine, look at some of Jack's. Yeah, it's you'll see it, it's some words. There. You'll see it in there. We use it extensively. We, you'll never see us quote code and say, well, pursuant to UCC 1-405. Why don't we quote? Well, for one, it's copyright. So we'd have an infringement and well, we'd have a, it's a, a little problem. It's a benefit using their code. There yep. you go. If you're, got if you're going international beyond the Uniform Commercial Code, the UNCITRAL Convention is another one which is out of the United Nations between nations and parties. And so internationally, you'll see a lot of the same process in the UNCITRAL conventions. But it's the same standards. Absolutely. The standards are the same. What you find in the UNCITRAL, you'll find in the UCC, you'll find in whatever other nations use as their standard. Because as it is, international commerce is happening every day, everywhere. Even a bank here in the United States is transacting with entities across the planet. So in order for them to have and transact business between, let's say, a Swiss citizen, these uniform principles of contracting are employed. So if I'm a bank in the United States and I'm contracting with a Swiss citizen, these standards of contract, they're recognized in Switzerland just as much as they're recognized in the United States, just as much as they're recognized in China or anywhere else. Yeah, we may all have different opinions which play out in the politics. I don't play politics. Politics is literally the science of taking a position. As a creditor, I don't take a position. But that's what politics is about. <laughs> In politics, you espouse to a position. You choose a position. Brandon's kind of telling you, you're going to be doing contracts. You have a book called the UCC that's important for you to familiarize yourself with. And some of the main language statements that are in there, and it's advisable. So when you take a look at some of the contracts and examples that he's going to give you in this administrative process, Go to the sections in the UCC and understand why you use them. Don't just do it, but start to understand why you say and do things. So that it will help your, you'll know what you're doing in a contract. And you'll learn then some nice conditional acceptances because we, we, we talked earlier, we want to teach you some good administrative procedures. There you have your contract. And the other side is we're going to spend some time talking about how you hold on to that contract. And then having the understanding of the principles will allow you to author your own process. You know, because then when you truly get to, when you truly get this and that's why it's so important to also understand the language of contract because you may come across your own contract dispute situation where you want to create a remedy outside of public benefit. You can then plagiarize some of the documents you've seen by people but when you put your document together, you're going to understand what you're saying instead of saying, well, Brandon did this or Jack did that or Gordon did this. This was their contract. And we've had guys just take pieces out of a contract. We see our stuff in their contract. And I'm going, what has this got to do with what you're doing there? 
I don't know what, and they say, I mean, this goes on like about once every two weeks. It just sounded good, Gordon. <laughs> I said, do you know what you're saying there? He says, no, it just sounded good to me because they were big words. I says, this has got nothing to do with what you're doing. Please read your document. Yeah, and actually that was another thing that my brother shared with me about his experience in his own personal growth and understanding of commerce was when he actually started just reading the documents, not from a place of, oh, I need to change my brother's name to my name here and change his address to my address. He started, saying, he started looking at it with the eyes of, what am I saying here? And what is it I want to say here? Because it used to be that my brother always used to come to me and like, here, Brandon, help me design my process. Now, he's designing his own. He creates them from the ground up, and they look nothing like my process. And when Garrett tells you, his brother, when he tells you about his experience with the IRS recently, <laughs> had he not commenced to do that himself, he couldn't have done what he's going to. He's got a great story. Uh, you guys, and whether it's, it's the Garrett best, It's or, the best creditor story ever. <laughs> Like, I, I was listening to it, and I'm just like, I wish I had handled myself that way in my interview. It's going to be good. Like, He's he got a did great it. story. He, he just, and he was in complete control of it. And, he, and it was, his confidence came from the understanding that he, had, that he had come about by learning this from the ground up, from creating his own remedies and processes from the ground up. Because he had done this, and because he had come to, and, and it's not like he's been doing this long. Like, yeah, Gordon's been doing it for years, and Jack's been doing it for years, and even I've been doing it for years. He's only been doing it for max a year. And he's like an expert now. I can tell you, when I met him, he was really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Matter of fact, he was almost <laughs> as stupid as me. <laughs> no. He didn't, he, it's a fact. I remember, I remember Garrett a year ago. He didn't have any, he just hanging around listening to stuff and, you know, let's go get something to eat. You know, that's what we, Garrett and I, and he really took an interest and I'm telling you, the story you're going to hear from him and his confidence is laudable. It's really impressive. Yeah. And it's, anybody would be proud to say that they could handle themselves like that because it's, I would, be, I would be proud to say I handled myself that way because the funny thing is, me and my brother just so happened to have interviews with the same two agents, the same CID agent and the same treasury agent. My interview was about a year and a half ago, though. And if I'd have handled myself well, the way, and I'm not to say I didn't handle myself well, I handled myself pretty well. But after hearing Garrett's story, I was like, damn, I wish I'd have handled myself like that. It's like he was outstanding. He was like on another planet. And I was just blown away that, wow, you know, that this, this stuff really can sink in fast. So don't disparage that this, is, this stuff's hard to get. It's really not. Once you, Garrett, Garrett even told me, he's all, once I got that it was about knowing who I was. He said, once, yeah. yeah if, you, if you'll spend a little bit of time on it and do get it, you're going to have epiphanies right and left. This stuff is so powerful. All these paragraphs in the contract book, the UCC book. You know, even I, when I'm reading this stuff, I might not understand all of it. I don't think Brandon does either. We'll spend a long time on just a sentence or a paragraph. But as you start getting it and you just pick up pieces right out of the middle of here, here, that just opens the door for more. And you're going to start, if you will apply yourselves, like anything, you'll become very proficient rather quickly. And we recommend if you're going to spend a half an hour a day, three times a week, an hour a day, three times a week, it's going to be very, very tough to get your paradigm shift, your pattern or model shift. And if shift. you are going to, and if let's say you are limited on time, I encourage you to share your experience and your growth and your understanding with other people. I mean, one of the greatest things I have is I have, for those of you familiar with the, the circles I run in, that you know people like Zach and my brother and my good friend Doug and Gordon here, when, when we get on the phone... J Jack, too. Yeah, Jack, Jack too. Jack, Jack yeah. too. <laughs> I, was, I thought he was asleep over there. When we get on the phone, we're sharing our understandings of things, and we're growing from it. You know, so it's not just one-sided, I'm not just trying to digest it all for myself. You know, we're, we're 
tossing things back and forth with each other. And that helps to build your own understanding. So I encourage you, find at least one other person that you guys can get on the phone and talk about things with, you know, because then you'll start to find that like maybe you're looking into this part of the UCC and they're studying this type of contract or they've got this kind of a process and they're going to run by you. Here, check out what I wrote in my conditional acceptance. You get on the calls with us Monday night or my Monday night. Jax is a different, you got to have Jax. My Monday nights are even a little bit different because I have a lot of testimonies and my students on there, but I've got one guy named Alan who's been recently arrested and in and out and dealing with a really cool case. But I hooked him up with uh, Rick, who just finished doing his thing, and they spent about 40 minutes on the phone the other day. It helped Rick, it helped Alan, and they both gained from it immensely. But if you're with us, you know, that we're going we're gonna to give you the other students' names. They get right on this call. There's 100 people on my call, and they're going, yeah, this is Rick. You can reach me at this phone number. And I say, all of you, call him who wants to talk to him. Rick got like, there was like that night, there was 76 people on the phone call. He got uh, three phone calls of people. Don't be shy. We tell you, they're on the phone. Yeah, call me. I'm happy to talk to you. They're happy to tell the story and relive it. And you're happy to get, that's where I get information. Jack and I do students every day. Jack and I work real close together on stuff. And we work with Brandon, uh, but Jack and I are like two, three, four hours every day on the telephone with our students, with this, with that, with this one. And we see a commonality. We pass it on to Brandon. Brandon tells us this. It will oh, be difficult. It's back and forth. It will like, be difficult. Like we're not, it, not neither, none of us is attached to it being a certain way and like we've got the right way. What we'll do is we'll, we'll have an idea of how we interpreted what a judge said, how a process we're developing is going, and what we, how we think the development of, should, of it should go and what we should do next. And I, I know personally, I know whenever it's us three on a call together and we're developing something, that if it weren't us three doing it, that it wouldn't end up nearly as potent as a, and as effective as it is because all three of us are taking three different approaches to it. And we're sharing it with each other. We've and discovered we're growing some from superb perception. things. Yeah, like we, we're, our our processes have become pretty ironclad, only because we're working with each other, not because I'm out there doing it by myself, not because Gordon's out there doing it by himself, not because Jack's out there doing it by himself, but because we come together, and we share. You know, it maybe takes two or more in a group to start really getting your ideas together. Scripture is right. You don't get it by yourself. Yeah. You get more inspiration when there's two or three out there. The other thing that I know Brandon and Gordon will tell you in doing your paperwork is learn to do most of your paperwork in about a page and a half. Yes. Because we will get our students out there and we'll be giving them ideas. And we always tell our students to attempt to do their paperwork and submit it to us and we'll review it. And most of the time, especially from new people, we will get back five, six, seven, eight pages where they're rambling on 30 on, pages. Telling their life story about everything. And, and Gordon and I kind of have a rule that if you can't get it done in three or four short, short paragraphs with an introduction, and a signature and enclosures and who it's going to, which takes up about two pages. You probably don't know what you're talking about and you're probably doing it wrong. And you're probably nullifying your own process by talking in circles. It's, it's hard to get around this idea. You get this big weighty document and you feel good about it. And literally, I, we had a student here a few months back. He had a 30 page document. I said, are you out of your mind? <laughs> I said, you got to change this. This will never work. You need 90 pages. <laughs> I said, go back and get it right. He says, okay, I made it real short. It was eight pages. I says, what, is you, what do you think short is? He says, I think eight pages is short. I said, one and a half pages, correct. This is a very simple thing. And that had the caption set taken half of it, so it fits on one page. <laughs> well, that's where we ended up trimming it down to was under two pages. Notice how you, he was able to say the same thing that he was saying in 30 pages in two pages. Oh, it's worse. If you say it in four or 10 or 20, 30 pages, 
what you've done is you've nullified everything you tried to do. You brought in so much stuff that you've made the, the document hopeless and worthless. And you can bet the judge is going to, judge happy to read, we did this thing for that, that, that uh, basketball player up in, in, uh, up in Marin County, and it was a one and a half page deal. Might have even been no more than that. It could have been just, was one paragraph, I think. One or two paragraphs. I got a copy of it with me. It was fantastic. It was a nice little short, sweet deal. The judge treated him good. The judge will read that. We knew that the judge will take a moment to take a flash on that, just hard hitting. And he walked for 60 days, got a chance to fix things. The thing we'd gotten before from another guy who said, this will put you in jail in a minute. One of his buddies did it. They're supposed to be doing it. I said, this is four pages of tripe. Jack looked at it. I said, what kind of crap is this? Brandon, you might want to talk about your abstract of judgment, too. That's what you do with that, right? Well, yeah, that's, a, that's uh, and actually, uh, even better, um, recently uh, we've come to some realizations on how to get our private remedies into the courts um, so that we could uh, move, get the courts to move in the direction we want to without even playing on the public side of the court. And I'll give you a for instance, I, that court case that I had with the IRS, okay? Now, it was, a, it was a, quite a process. And only the reason was it was a full due process. There was a full three steps. You're talking about the one you got going now? Yeah. There were well, four they parties. Don't know. Br Brandon has a civil suit going on with the IRS over wanting to enjoin him from teaching certain things. <laughs> they don't and want me talking. <laughs> so it's not a criminal case it's a simple civil case so that's what he's talking about when it came out about four months ago oh Brandon was indicted I said you know the rumors were he was indicted and arrested oh, I, I said arrested. no he wasn't <laughs> I said he was not only indicted and arrested did you see his back they gave him 50 lashes in the public square in the pillory what did you hear you know I'm, I'm just like getting way over they're going you're, are you making fun I said a public pillory? What is wrong with you? <laughs> there is no public pillory lashing people in the public. <laughs> this is a simple civil suit. So, but anyway, this is a suit he's talking about. But, so. the, but the process ended up being like after I had completed the whole thing and I had compiled the entire record, including all the notary's records of, because remember, there were four parties at every level. And I included, you know, of course, what they had presented on me, which included, you know, their, their complaint was 30 pages. Not one part of my process was ever more than two pages. Actually, no, I take that back. Because I had to address all the points in their complaint, my typical two-page process became four or five. Only because when I wrote out my affidavit, I had to make sure I addressed every single point and rebutted every single presumption that their document made. So it was, but not, not, none of my documents were really more than four or five pages, but because the process itself was so big, that there was so much going on in so many records, all the postal records, all the notaries records, all the certificates, that the entire record of this entire process ended up being 111 pages. That's now, only because you, when you do step one, you send them step two, you send them step one again. When you do three, you might send them step one and two with three. But that didn't include any duplicates. Go. I didn't duplicate like step one three times in that uh, because this sure. is what I was presenting to the judge. I'm so just was, trying to get these was, people not scared of what you're right, saying. You're yeah. talking 118 pages and we've had three heart attacks yeah, already. Yeah, no, no, no. This, this, and it would never be this. But like I said, it just became a very large record because there was so much going on in this particular process. But... The entire thing was summed up for the judge on one page. And that page that I, I authored and I actually I gave a copy of it to, for, to Gordon for him to use in his own personal process. And we used that to carry our process into the private side of the court. That one page document does and says everything we need to say to the judge. It's an abstract of 111 pages. That's all yeah. it is. Yeah. An abstract is a short synopsis so that the party knows what's going on. Yep. And the judge will read one page. You will not read 118. <laughs> yeah, guaranteed. He's 111. Not, he's not going to want to read it. But now, because I've summed up the whole thing, he knows what the 111 pages are. He knows that, okay, this is a record. And everything that I need to support what he's saying in this one page is all here. 
and it's all outlined. You know, I had a very detailed table of contents, which I call a certificate of service, which deta in detail outlines every step of the process. And then that one cover page carried the whole thing in. So in reality, I was able to say everything I needed to say about a 111 page process in one page. We're going to give you copies of this stuff. You're going to understand how to do an administrative remedy. We're going to distill it down into simplistics for yeah, you. Yeah. And you can, get, you can get some sanitized copies of this stuff that you can plagiarize things from. Well, it's important. You can't just fabricate it new. I take stuff from his documents, from his. He takes them from mine. He takes them from mine. We, we share with our students all the time. And you time. pluck we stuff out of new stuff? And we tell them to construct their own paperwork. The because, prosecutor sends yeah. something, we take it out of their stuff. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. I've taken stuff from attorneys. Like, I, I've, I've learned to always look at everything in such a way that I'm, what can I gain from this? Like, you should see me when I'm in court, I'm listening intently. Like, if I, must, I must look kind of silly because I'm like this, <laughs> listening to the judge because I really want to get, like, I'm like, cut out all distractions because I believe that the judge is giving me gold. And every time I'm in there, that's been my experience, that the judge is giving me absolute gold. So I'm sitting there listening intently. Hey, bailiff, be ready for the guy that's going <laughs> to leap. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sitting there just like literally on, like leaning forward on the table. Like, what does the judge have to say about this? And listening intently to every word because he's giving me my remedy. These judges give you so like a lot of. You got to go to court and listen to them. They're just spilling it out every day. Yeah, uh, put the, some of the processes I'll share this weekend around the mortgages. A judge was kind enough to share that with me, <laughs> because he was he was giving me gold right there in the courtroom. He was mm -hmm. telling me the nature behind title and possession and account, and he was doing it subtly to where nobody else in the courtroom caught on, but I caught on. And he gave me absolute gold. I mean, I remember, like, uh, another good practice for those of you who will be dealing in court, go sit in court and go watch the judges work their magic. I was there one day, and this judge literally gave away how to be an honor to everybody in that room and how to get your remedy. And, and I was just like, oh, did you guys hear that? <laughs> Nobody got it. And in fact, the one guy he's trying to help was like not accepting it. The judge straight up told him, like the guy, the, the, the judge basically recognized that this guy was an honorable and that just some circumstances had gotten in the way of him being in honor because the judge basically was even saying, well, yeah, it looks like, you know, you've been honorable. You've been doing this. You've been doing that. Looks to me like this one little circumstance, you know, isn't worth, you know, throwing away all this, you know, all this honorable action that you've been a part of. So the judge goes, I'll tell you what, you plead guilty, pay, you'll pay this amount, it was like a couple hundred dollars, and you'll walk out of here today, and you'll be done with it. Or you can plead not guilty, we're going to take you into custody. You're going to spend some time in jail. You're going to pay five times that amount. What is it you'd like to do? No, the guy was like, like seriously, like, uh. <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> like he just told you how to get your remedy. But the stigma of pleading guilty had totally thrown this guy, <laughs> and he didn't want to do it. And I'm like, dude, the judge just told you, you're walking out of here for a couple hundred bucks, what do you or do? you're going to go do? into jail and pay a couple thousand dollars, and you still might end up getting convicted. What do you do? Was, what do you do? He, he actually ended up going, like, after, like, uh, well, and the judge is just like, I'm just like, like, I felt the way the judge did, like, what an idiot. <laughs> Like, really? This, I just gave this, and I'm like... We were laughing in the back. I was laughing. Well, and, <laughs> and, and everyone in the room, like, didn't get it. I'm like, he just gave all these... Because we just... The funny thing is, the only reason we were even in that court is because our, the judge for our case was sick. 
And so they had moved all the cases into this courtroom to get scheduled. And this judge, man, I watched him make, what, a couple hundred grand in an hour? Like literally, boom, boom, boom. And within one hour, he had made that county or the state of California uh, probably a couple hundred thousand dollars. Just processing. Moving through these things like it was nothing. And he gave them all solid gold right there in the moment. No one realized it. All the sheep just... (laughs) Didn't realize what he had just done, but he had just given them. Here's how to be honorable. Here's how to get your remedy. How every single one of you could walk out of here today with much less a penalty, with no controversy... And not one, and the one guy so he gave do? it to expressly, do? he actually ended up doing it. <laughs> but it was like, oh, he was like seriously deliberating. Like, well, do I want to go to jail? <laughs> you know? And I was just like, it was like, it was like a minor thing. Like he had missed, like he had missed checking in or he had missed doing something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it was like maybe a probation violation, but a minor one. And the judge was like, just plead guilty to it. Pay, the, pay a couple hundred bucks and you're done. Cool. Nothing, you don't have to worry about anything else. And because the word guilty was in there, this guy was fighting himself on it. Like, what should I do? And I was just blown away because we actually, <clears throat> me and uh, my brother had, a, had a, an ex-girlfriend of his contact him and, and she knew that he was into some strange things when it came to contract and law. And she she's just knows nothing about what, what it is we do. So my brother basically gave her, okay, here's the simple way to handle your situation. Because she happened to get a speeding ticket that if she'd have been, that if, if she'd have got the points against her record because she, she drives a company car and all these other things, and because she's a sales rep, I think, for pharmaceuticals or something like that, that she would have, been, she would have lost her job. And so she was like, I, she needed a remedy. So my brother goes, okay. He, he gave her the, here's the really, really easy version that you don't have to really know much. Just do exactly what I tell you to do. Yeah, she literally walked in there with the script, which is funny. We do this with our students, and they still can't stick by the script. <laughs> when we tell them, go in there and be the debtor. Just say this, and they still can't do it. <laughs> you know. But she went in there. She had her script. And my brother said, tell the judge, your honor, I wish to plead guilty to the facts and I want to effect payment immediately. And he even told her, hold up your checkbook in one hand and hold up a pen in the other hand. The idea idea was to be in honor the entire time she was in the courtroom. Now, when you just pay a a ticket online or, or send in the payment, you never really showed up. So that's why the point hits your license. So she was in honor the entire time. And by trying to effect payment in the courtroom, she was staying in honor. And she was pleading guilty to the facts. Remember, what is the first, when you're in court, Jack, is that your first hearing? You're on appeal. You're on appeal. So are you here to create a controversy? And yeah, it's, by pleading guilty, you're saying, I'm just here to pay. So the judge goes like this, I know what you're trying to do. He smiles at her, he goes, I know what you're trying to do. He goes, go ahead and write the check for, it was like, she was like, what, 30 miles over the speed limit or 20 miles over the speed limit? It was going to be a $400 ticket. Yeah, it was going to be a $400 ticket. What did she have to pay, 60 bucks, 90 bucks? He goes, write the check out for this amount, give it to the clerk, whatever. Not one point ever went on her record. Mike, the way the judge worded it is he said, I'm going, he goes, I understand what you're trying to do. I'm going to allow you to pay the clerk outside. And basically giving her the acceptance of the payment in the court, but take it to her because I don't want to deal with it. So he said, I'm going to allow you. I see you're in honor. You're pay, trying to pay in here. I'm going to allow you to go pay the clerk outside. Every, everything else you said correctly. I'm going to allow you to pay the clerk outside, which infers there's a difference between when you pay it at the clerk's window as opposed to coming into court and being an honor. 
And because she just stuck by the script, she was honorable, pleaded guilty to the facts, wished to affect payment immediately, never, never had one point go against her license, paid a fraction of what the fine should have been, which if she just said, well, Your Honor, I plead not guilty, she would have paid the $500, the points would have gone on her record, and she would have lost her job. You're not everybody's going to get the same result. I had a young man that was at a halfway house when I was there. He stayed out one night, didn't come back. He was late, so he just didn't show. You're going back to jail. In the federal halfway house, you don't just not show. Next day, he shows up. He's grabbing his gear, and he's booking out of there. I said, where are you going? He says, man, I didn't make it back last night. I said, I know. He says, I, I don't want to go down. I said, I tell you what. If you get yourself, decide to come back, I said, do, do this. Simply make no excuse and say, forgive me. Don't say, please forgive me. Forgive me. That's a command. I said, don't apologize. Don't say, I'm sorry. Because those words have certain meanings. Next, that night he calls in. to The security girl says, I want to come in. I'm... She says, where have you been? He says, look, I don't make any excuse. It's my fault. I'm late. I'm coming in. I'll take responsibility. I only have two words. Forgive me. She says, just get in here. He says, I'll be in. He came in. I said, hey, you made it in. Good to see you. He says, yeah, I talked to them. You know. I says, well, we'll see what happens. Next morning, I'm checking out of there. And he's standing there. And the security girl comes out. She looks at him. She goes, what are you doing here? Waiting for the marshals to come get me. Because he's supposed to be, he's an electrician. He's supposed to be at work. He said, I'm just waiting for the marshals to come get me because that's just standard. You're going down for that. They don't mess with you. She looks at him and says, you've been forgiven. Get back to work. Outrage. I think, Gordy, you have an interest, way interesting young man here. Gordy, he has a very interesting story we'll get to uh, after either, either dinner or tomorrow because you need to hear some of this. Now, is that going to work for everybody? Just say, forgive me. I can't tell you that it is because his come from, where each person comes from. How did he say it? What did she sense on the phone? I don't know. All I know is that the Spirit of the Lord moves in an interesting way. And he knows your heart. So you're not going to fool anybody with just saying words. A lot of our students think that just saying the words are going to make the difference. It can't be. Where do you really, really want to come from, ladies and gentlemen? Where is your heart? Is, are you truly kind to come into harmony? I had a recent, uh, this guy, Bob Lester, who just got out of jail. I says, Bob, he says, yeah, they got me on probation. I, wanted, I need you to teach me so I can get rid of that probation. We had him on the Monday night. He was just on the Monday night with me. I says, Bob, what is it you really want to do? They're trying to remember what I told you. He said, well, I don't want to have to do this. I said, ah, wrong. I says, are you not wanting to assist them so that they don't have to monitor you? Isn't that your real goal? I said, the result's the same, but the come from is different. He says, no, no, you're right, you're right. Well, you've got to try and, why do I not want to do probation? Was I trying to get out of probation? Do that? No, I don't want to trouble probation department with having to monitor another guy. They have all sorts of people they need to monitor and care for. I want to be an honor. They don't need to monitor me. I don't want to waste their time. Was I trying to get out of probation? Yeah, duh. But that isn't what I was thinking and saying. I'm trying to get the come from. I really was trying to get that. Jack was getting me there. I'm trying to get it. I said, this is what we're trying to accomplish. And some unique stories during that time. It was just, it's so cool when you're in honor. It's the treatment you get, the different things, the funny things that go on. There's no other explanation than that your heart will shine through your come from. So, Absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to get you there on the come from as well as the administrative process and then how to hold your come from. Where are you coming from from your heart? Did you want to have a dinner break or wrap up a little and then break for the night? Um, I was going to say it's already, we kind of ran late over on the last one, so we're at uh, almost 7 o'clock now. If we took a two-hour, that would be 9. It'd probably be too late to come yeah, back here yeah, and do Yeah, it's not going to get anything done. Um, so what we can do is... Uh, Knock off to start in the morning or a little yeah, more? Yeah, we could just uh, call it, yeah.
What's the, what do you mean the manager? Well, I think, I think what he's thinking is, she's just saying they have a, a little quick special you could have and come back and do more. And, and you can ask everybody, would you rather uh, break for dinner, get started fresh tomorrow morning? We got two more solid days, nine to nine to do. You can sometimes get information overload. We don't want to overload you. It's going to get real intense with some of these administrative yeah. processes yeah, we're, we're going to give you. <laughs> you can tell, huh? <laughs> why, why not? Why not? You know, we can we can look at it. We go on and on. Ja this is what Jack Brand and I do all night and day. So I mean, we can sit here till nine tonight with you. But in reality, you might be better off enjoying knock off for the evening, have a nice dinner, you know, ponder some of the things, go look at the URL, kind of relook, rebrief on some of the stuff you've done here. Uh, Go oh, see that's, yeah, that's actually a great idea. You know, yeah, before you go see Inception, get on the URL, read Jack's uh, <laughs> interpretation of it, because Jack is our movie expert, and he's the, uh, he's the guy we look to that makes my movies more interesting without Jack telling me. I wouldn't go to most of the movies I go to if you didn't tell me about them. And I, and I go watch them, and I see movies, and I can pick out parts, but not like Jack. Like, I'm on a scale of 100. I'm at about a 4, and Jack's at about 99, you know, <laughs> for understanding those movies. So I, if you read Inception from Jack's interpretation, or in some of you have heard him interpret Matrix and stuff, he's just so good at what he does. Other stuff he's not so good at, but that stuff he's good at. <laughs> so, you know, if Was I didn't... If I, well, yeah, sort of. You know, if I didn't bring him back a little bit, you know, he's just going to be... Look at the size of his head. <laughs> anyway, we Not love all of you. Do you want, you want a break for dinner and, and for the uh, evening? Or? Um, if you, I mean, I'll leave it up to you guys. If you guys want to come back, we can, uh, 